This video is brought to you in part by Exter. More on them in a bit. Remember that time at E3 2012 when Sony spent 15 straight minutes over one-sixth of their conference showcasing an augmented reality book video game thing by having several adults just sit on the floor and learn Harry Potter spells? No? Doesn't, doesn't ring a bell? You know, the book that was marketed and then mostly sold separately from the PS Move, despite requiring the Move and the PlayStation Eye camera to work, a rare peripheral for a peripheral... for a peripheral? Still no? It was sandwiched right in between announcing what would become the worst Call of Duty game of all time, other than whichever one you don't like of course, and the first gameplay of The Last of Us, how could you miss it? Even if you do vaguely recall the PlayStation Wonder Book, odds are you've never seen one in the wild, and that's because it is the single least used feature of the PlayStation 3. Yes, even less utilized than 3D TV support, less used than the PS3's short-lived Linux compatibility, heck, with only four painfully short games released for this thing across a single year before never being acknowledged again, far less than the one book a thousand stories tagline that Sony pushed, Wonder Book has a strong argument to be the least used feature across every PlayStation system. And yes, I'm counting the Vita itself as a feature there. You would think that must mean this weird book thing just sucks, but color me surprised when I started messing around in those four different games, and I discovered that it's, at times, more responsive than the PlayStation Move itself, which was already surprisingly responsive for a motion gimmick. Uh, most of the time, at least. This thing made a physical book a far more creative and interactive feature than you would expect in video game form, with games that ask you to fold the book to solve puzzles like bending a rope down for a character to grab onto, or rotating the book around to get a new perspective on the pop-up world you would see on screen. One of these titles is genuinely really good, developed by an interactive film studio just off the backs of their Oscar-winning short film, and it's probably no surprise that there were multiple other games planned that never saw the light of day, including a Toy Story Wonder Book title that was intended to be the first in a running partnership between PlayStation and Disney. With Wonder Book having been conceptualized for about as long as the PlayStation Move itself and in active development for longer, Sony seemed to put its full support behind the concept up until it released. Or at least that's what it seems like from the outside. From the inside, this book's story is a lot more fascinating. It's the story of two different products being developed simultaneously for PlayStation's camera peripheral, an accidental contest between Sony's European and American divisions, a contest that one was always destined to lose. So what happened that left this thing as a completely forgotten oddity rather than a, well, probably still slightly less forgotten oddity? Take a seat and make sure you've got ample space to swing your arms around. This is the complicated history of PlayStation's least used feature. This is the story of Wonderbook. Given that it's such a late PS3 release and an afterthought at that, you might be surprised to learn that the Wonder Book's origins go back way further than any of us might expect, somehow taking us back to 1999 and the early pitches for the PS2's iToy camera. A guy by the name of Richard Marks joined Sony that year after having the light bulb go off during an early PS2 hardware demo at 1999's Game Developers Conference, and like a lot of the more um, out there PlayStation ideas, the concept took hold in what would become PlayStation's London studio thanks to some pushing by the at-the-time head of Sony Computer Entertainment Europe, Phil Harrison. This London team was responsible for pretty much every major iToy game, continuing to learn and hone the crappy little webcam's capabilities, all the while also producing the SingStar games and accidentally creating what would become PlayStation Home when pitching an online lobby system for The Getaway 2 on PS2. Again, Sony's weird stuff always starts in London. While London Studio dominated the software conversation, many of the same minds that developed the iToy hardware moved on to developing its PlayStation I successor on the PS3, as well as PS Move, PSVR, and the newest PlayStation camera for PS4 and 5. However, the story starts to split a bit, as early iToy prototypes started out with the same sort of color-based wand controller with a stupid glowing sphere on top that would later be picked back up and become the PlayStation Move. 
That's right, the earliest tests for what would become PlayStation Move came around the same time that Nintendo was developing the early tests for what would become the Wii. Go figure, and that'll kind of be important later. But iToy itself quickly shifted focus towards hand gestures and no controller at all, leading London Studio to focus on this sort of mixed reality integration and even toying around with augmented reality or AR prototypes. In fact, the first Wonderbook storyboard concept came around 2005. The PS3's eye peripheral shared iToy's hands-free focus when it was being designed as a launch window peripheral for the PlayStation 3, although it ended up being delayed into 2007 so as to not release an expensive peripheral on the same day as a 599 US dollar console. Not long after that, pretty blatantly due to the Wii's success, PS Move's ideas were picked back up and restarted proper development in 2008 using the eye's tracking, while also being future-proofed for intended use with an eventual head-mounted VR device down the road. Wonderbook started its life as a controllerless concept, just like the rest of London Studio's motion games, and then seemingly, due to internal politics, had Move controller integration forced upon it. So, it hit both sides of Sony's motion gaming history, ending up as this weird connecting tissue that ever so briefly brought the two split paths together before the PS Move cannibalized the hands-free side. The PS3i's first mixed reality test was the game it launched with, a game called The Eye of Judgment, which required you to buy physical trading cards made by Wizards of the Coast and then play via the PS3 game by filming the playmat with your camera. After this fared surprisingly well on a technical level, London Studio took a crack at producing a similar AR experience. Using the same sort of blocky markers that that game's cards utilized, think a QR code of sorts, they produced two concepts. One that only required a single code card and would become 2009's iPet Virtual Pet Sim game, and the other, an augmented reality book that would need many more of these anchor markings and much more confidence that their tech would work reliably. So, the simpler one went first, naturally, with Wonderbook's production beginning immediately thereafter. Every Wonderbook is the same, with the same anchor markers appearing on specific pages so that the camera can detect which page you're on relative to the chapter of the game you're playing, and load and display the proper pages. The book only has 12 pages in total, limiting each chapter, pardon the pun, on paper, although not in practice, since each of the games find a way to stretch these chapters out sometimes to 30 plus minutes. Now here's what's really interesting to me. The tech was so quickly put together after iPad released, and the concepts had already been tumbling around internally for years at this point, that by early 2010, external studios were developing for Wonderbook. These leaked screenshots are from at least one cancelled game, called Wonderbook Book of Tales, which would run through a number of different fairy tale stories in an interactive pop-up fashion. I'm not quite sure if this is just one game or multiple, given how large its scope seems to be compared to the games that did release for Wonderbook, and given that the internal video demos from 2012 were immediately wiped by Sony Europe and are gone forever unless somebody happened to back it up and has been sitting on it for over a decade now. Anyway, this project was led by a French studio by the name of MKO Games, in conjunction with Sony's London studio. Notably, none of the surviving screenshots feature a PlayStation Move controller anywhere in sight, which is particularly interesting since three of the four Wonderbook titles require Move no matter what, and the fourth one honestly does too, at least to get past the title screen. Now, looking at the development overlap between the Move and Wonderbook, it's my belief that these two products ended up being seen internally as competing concepts, rather than the weird one-two punch they eventually got marketed as. Why do I say that? Well, London Studio's iPad game was held back from release for an entire year only in the United States in order to release it as a Move game rather than using the AR code cards. And London Studio's contribution to the Move library was limited to this re-release, sloppy integrations into dancing games that indicated a struggle to get the Move controllers working in a satisfying way, a cancelled first-person horror game, again due to struggles getting the Move controllers to work in a satisfying way, and Wonderbook, which still struggles struggles with a Move controller at times, despite the studio having had four to five years of experience with the controller by then. Oh, that horror game, by the way, it was dropped after a couple years of rough production hell, at which point Sony decided to move it to a different British studio before the game shifted forms a few more times, dropped the PS Move support and first-person approach, and eventually released on the PS4 as Until Dawn. Go figure. As I hit on earlier, PlayStation Move was rushed into production in 2008 by the hardware team in Japan, combined with the so-called Magic Lab in California, led by that same Richard Marks who brought the camera concept to the PS2 in the first place. 
Incidentally, the guy who brought Richard Marx to London to first show off the Eye Toy idea back in 2000, Phil Harrison, he was suddenly ousted from his role as head of PlayStation's Worldwide Studios right around the same time as this hasty PS move greenlight, after Harrison got caught talking smack about PlayStation Japan's resistance to his pushing for more social games. The stuff like Eye Toy, SingStar, the Buzz Quiz games that he had been responsible for spearheading, all successful properties developed in Britain under his watch, and how Harrison was pissed off that the Wii immediately proved him right in his mind, implying that the PS3 would have fared better early on if Japan had just listened to him. In the wake of his ouster from the company, Japan Studios' Shuhei Yoshida took over as head of Worldwide Studios, and the European branch of PlayStation saw its influence wane. So, when two different motion-controlled products were potentially ready for launch during the same 2010 holiday season, one had to lose out, and the one that was going to lose was the one that probably had the least amount of push backstage. Mind you, of course, this was also definitely the right call. It'd be hilarious to imagine a world where Sony's answer to the Wii and Kinect was a f***ing book instead of the very expensive R&D that a much larger group of people was working on at the same time. However, Wonderbook losing out meant that it had to be restructured around PlayStation Move integration simply to avoid releasing two different motion gimmicks back-to-back -back and confusing customers. This would, of course, mean delays, possibly even leading to the cancellation of that Book of Tales game. Now that Wonderbook has started to merge back into PS Move, we can start getting into the four Wonderbook games that did release. Another interesting thing is that there are pretty good odds that Wonderbook may have ended up just becoming a single game with a bunch of cancelled prototypes, if not for some more coincidental timing. In 2011, Sony partnered with Warner Brothers to create an interactive social network of sorts tying into the Harry Potter franchise, called Pottermore. Somewhere along the line during these discussions, Potter's writer was shown the Wonder Book, which led to the idea for a Book of Spells, and since London Studio had move controllers on hand, that idea quickly got lumped in to become the player's wand. This Sony Pottermore relationship extended into the Book of Potions game the following year, and both games featured the ability to connect your Pottermore account to the game. As the website has since changed into some sort of blog a few years later, that connectivity, I'm going to assume, does not work anymore. Both of these two games take similar forms, making you a student at Hogwarts who's been given access to either of the titular books, which are kept in the restricted section of the library. I don't really know the weird wizard lore all that well, but the spells you're taught in this book seem pretty 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 standard, so it's weird that it's kept locked up somewhere, but, but whatever. It's also kind of weird that they describe the rigidity, firmness, girthiness, and length of the different wands you can choose from. Is that is that just a thing in this universe? No wonder this series was huge on Tumblr. Ugh. In Book of Spells, there are five chapters, each split into two 12-page halves that teach you different spells. Often, there are these little pop-up book papercraft stories to give you some fun background lore of the spells, and in general, this game is a very talky experience. Thankfully, you can just wave your wand at the text most of the time and push it to the side to read through it faster if you don't want to wait for the slow, Britishy narration. In total, you can learn 21 spells across your journey here, as well as engage in some thrilling quizzes about the stuff the game tells you about. It's honestly funny to me, the coolest parts about this game and the Wonder Book in general always involve the book itself, with the move controller being as much of an afterthought as it sounds like based on all the history we just went over. Like, I've messed with these move controllers a decent bit in the past, both on PS3 and via PSVR, and this game's tracking feels worse than the usual PS Move standards. The wand motions aren't all that clean, and the game really limits most of the wand integration into drawing a shape to cast the corresponding spell, occasionally pointing the wand at something or wiggling it to throw out a spell after equipping it. Meanwhile, the book will contain these wormholes that make you tilt the book upwards towards the camera to look into them to find the clue, or wipe the dust off the book with your hands. It's not nearly as involved as the later three games, but the book's tracking is much firmer, and you can tell where the care went, essentially. The closest that this one comes to feeling like a semi-satisfying game rather than a slower but slightly more interactive book is near the end of each chapter, when you're asked to put all of the chapter's spells together to solve a challenge, like going through multiple screens finding a saddle to put on a rampaging water horse... thing. Book of Spells just isn't a very good showcase of what Wonder Book could have been capable of, and given the lengthy gap between this and the rest of the Wonder Book games, as we'll go into in a moment, I feel bad for anybody that broke out their wallet day one on this thing. Especially since back in 2012, they wouldn't have had the luxury of pulling out a wonderful wallet from Exter, the sponsor of today's video. 
Now, maybe it's because I don't wear cargo shorts with the little leg pockets, but from day one, I've always had a slim wallet, something that's easy to fit into a normal pocket, but not easy to lose. So when Extra reached out, they were a perfect fit. See, these fine folks have a whole slate of sustainable wallets and accessories, and thanks to their solar-powered tracker card here, you'll never have to worry about misplacing or forgetting it. Leave this bad boy in the sun for just a couple hours, and it's got three months worth of charge. That's three months of being able to straight up call your wallet if you can't find it, or three months of it being able to ping your phone as you walk away because, oops, you left it at the restaurant table. And beyond just the tracker, Extra's super slim card holder can hold up to 12 cards and cash. It blocks RFID signals so that you're not at risk of data theft, and you can pop those cards out nice and easy with just the press of a button. Hell, sometimes I just press the button a bunch just to see them slide out like that. It's kind of cool. It makes me feel like I'm a Yu-Gi-Oh man. What does that mean? Why is that? I, why did I say that? I don't know what that means. And best of all, I've got an exclusive discount for you to make this a no-brainer. Visit my link below or enter the code GOLDEN at checkout to get up to 25% off. Thanks again to Extra for sponsoring this segment, and now, let's get back to it. Now, the Book of Potions, while we're getting through the boring games first, is thankfully much more involved, although, in a kind of tedious way, there are a couple more chapters for one, and there's a proper goal beyond simply learning spells. Here, the book's writer enchanted the Book of Potions centuries ago, and teleports you to a potion-making competition between different schools. This one plays much more like a 2008 Wii game in a lot of ways, with much of your time spent chopping, juicing, or grinding different ingredients to put into your cauldron and make the potions. However, since it's a move game with the move's superior technology, it tracks where you're chopping instead of just being a dumb shake the controller minigame, so you'll spend a lot more time not sure which part of an onion the game thinks isn't chopped enough yet. It makes you put down the move controller a bunch to change from your wand to a knife or a spoon for stirring, stuff like that, and in general the formula for these potions will usually end up being chop or grind stuff a bunch, throw it in the pot, stir it, repeat because you're only halfway to the amount of that first ingredient that you need, then chop or grind grind some other stuff up, do that whole process again twice because again you don't have the ingredients you need all the way in one go, and then halfway in they just give up and give you a bunch of already finished liquid ingredients to pour in, as if the developers themselves got bored halfway through and wanted to rush through the rest of the potion. You can make mistakes if you don't follow the instructions, and you'll earn a zero days since last accident trophy at least, which is cute, but the mistakes don't seem to have any real effect otherwise. And while there's a whole custom concoction option too in the main menu, where you can throw any combination of the 36 ingredients together and see what tortuous results befall your poor little test frog, A, that's kind of f***ed up, and B, I don't think it does anything besides change the frog's color and say, cool, good job, you made a potion. Thankfully, once again, the book itself does have some neat integrations. Often, Book of Potions will ask you to spin the book around, to rotate it to look at different parts of the plant you're observing. Seeing the plant rotating in AR is just kinda neat, it's really novel, especially in a few examples where, as you rotate, you'll see the plant go through the seasons, wilting in the fall, barren in winter so you can scan the roots to learn more about the plant, blooming in spring, flowering in summer, stuff like that. When the main motion control stuff is so obligatory, you take what you can get, and playing these first two had me optimistic that the book stuff would continue to be neat, even if the games themselves were maybe boring to leaning on dreadful in part because of how tedious the move controller parts were. What's most baffling about these two games is they weren't both launch titles. These two were released a year apart. See, Wonderbook and Book of Spells released on November 13th, 2012 in two bundles. There was a full PS Move bundle priced at 80 bucks, which came with the game, book, a move controller, and the eye camera, and there was a $40 version that contained just the game and the book. The next Wonderbook title to release was Diggs Nightcrawler, a noir-inspired detective game that didn't drop until six months after Book of Spells in Europe. In the US, any poor kids who got the Wonderbook at launch or for Christmas had to wait an entire year to sniff at another game. Diggs, as well as a BBC Walking with Dinosaurs game and Book of Potions, all three of them released in North America on November 12th, 2013, just three days before the PlayStation 4 dropped, with those latter two games hitting Europe on the PS4's American launch day. This was your consolation prize for having to wait an extra two weeks for the PS4 over there. Hope it was worth it. So the extra 12 months of development time between the books of spells and potions really didn't lead to a substantial enough improvement. Both games are short, maybe three to four hours long, following the exact same formula, and most of the changes from the first game to the second amount to, we made the move stuff more annoying, and the book stuff kinda cooler, but not by a lot. 
Now I'm gonna save Diggs Nightcrawler for last since it's easily the best of these games and move along to the BBC's Walking with Dinosaurs, a tie-in video game to Walking with Dinosaurs 3D, a 2013 animated movie based on the critically acclaimed 1999 documentary of the same name. Co-developed by London Studio and Supermassive, technically kind of the same as Until Dawn in that regard, this was intended to be the first in a longer partnership between Sony and the BBC to create more edutainment Wonder Book titles, but like the multi-game Disney Wonder Book deal, that quickly fell through since the Wonder Book was barely marketed after its dreadful 15 minutes worth of E3 announcement, despite the only launch game being from one of the most recognizable children's book franchises ever naturally not being marketed pretty much whatsoever, led to underwhelming sales. Part of this, again, I attribute indirectly to the PlayStation Move and the internal politics or perhaps machinations of Sony. Shuhei Yoshida, the at-the-time president of PlayStation's Worldwide Studios after Phil Harrison left the company, had said in an interview after Move's 2010 release that there was this internal grassroots movement among different coders and engineers, which led to early VR prototypes and had everybody looking towards virtual reality instead of mixed or augmented reality. Alongside a widespread push towards VR as the future and away from AR both in games and in general, Wonderbook ended up conceptualized slightly too early and presentable slightly too late to ever have a chance at getting a footing. So, whatever losses could be recouped, were recouped. Projects that weren't far enough along were dropped in place of London Studio getting started on what would become the PSVR's demo disc, and whatever was almost done was finished and then sat on for a year for some reason and just completely buried. You know, buried like dinosaurs. I, I f you, okay? That's the best I got. This guy looks mean. For an edutainment game, Walking with Dinosaurs is actually way better than it has any right to be. The game's chapters follow a specific cast of dinos around, using their journey to teach you about different species of flora and fauna, seasonal migration habits, even x-raying them using the move controller to learn about their bones and physical makeup. Now, I say cast to describe how the two narrators treat the dinosaurs, but it's not like the dinosaurs themselves are talking characters. They're, they're just regular animals given names and stories in the style of countless nature documentaries out there that have done the same. That said, the first chapter of this game, at least, does feature characters referenced in the animated movie, which did go the voiced character route in a break from both the game and the original 99 documentary. In fact, one of the leads in that movie is voiced by Justin Long, which makes it fitting that this game came out the same week as Knack, where Justin was a facial reference model. Every 12 pages, or one use of the full book, is half a chapter and takes about half an hour, which makes this the longest Wonder Book game. It's the most in-depth, too, when you look at the stories that the game tries to tell, whether it's trying to give you anxiety watching ancient crocodiles sabotaging a river crossing and nearly eating a little orphan dino, or surprisingly detailed pop-up locales both in first-person find-the-creature segments using the move controller, or top-down segments where you rotate the book to locate all the plant and animal facts hidden therein. Sometimes it'll have you weighing a dinosaur on a scale, using tanks and buses as reference so that kids could understand what 100 tons looks like. Or it'll have you hammer and dust a dig site like you're an archaeologist. These may be the same simple PS move actions as grabbing an item in Book of Potions or casting a spell, but the more interactive context around this game makes it feel cozier, and also maybe in part because it's Supermassive who had more success with the move part of the controllers, it feels like it's a little bit more calibrated too. Similar to something I didn't mention about the prior two games, this one will sometimes ask you to shout out a name or command, to try and get a dinosaur's attention or scare off a predator. But unlike in those first two games, some of these won't move on if you don't trigger the microphone. This was fun to discover because I couldn't get the microphone to work at any time during either Book of Spells or Potions, and I only finally got it to work this time after a few minutes when I just happened to cough while googling why the mic wasn't picking up at all. Apparently. Coughing was loud enough that it worked, and shouting was not. So, so there, there, there you go. Walking with Dinosaurs even ends many chapter segments with these quick time event battles. It's not the prettiest game up close, and weirdly it's locked at 720p for me when the prior two games were 1080p, but this somehow is the least finicky and most interesting use of move in any of these games. Again, maybe because it was super massive that had more of a hand in production? I'm not sure, but either way, it's genuinely a really fun little learning experience, and it finds a way to better combine talking at you with letting you look around and find stuff for yourself compared to the two Potter book games.
However, Diggs Nightcrawler blows all three of these games out of the water, at least in terms of being a fun, unique use of the book's different gimmicks and abilities. It's the perfect story to fit into a book game, as you team up with a literal bookworm to solve the mystery of who killed Humpty Dumpty and framed our unlikely detective partner. This one was co-produced by Moonbot Studios, a group that created 2011's Oscar-winning animated short film The Fantastic Flying Books of Mr. Morris Lesmore, what a, what a wonderful name, as well as diving into a number of interactive book game ideas before The Wonder Book. The writing and dialogue perfectly captures the spirit of the noir genre, with a protagonist that talks out of the side of his mouth and never runs out of witticisms, and a setting that combines this uneasy, seedy 1940s city with countless fairy tales. The Three Little Pigs, for example, are feckless cops, the Itsy Bitsy Spider is a jazz bar singer, you're frequently sneaking around the hear no evil, speak no evil, see no evil monkeys, and as the story develops you learn from characters like Bo Peep and Mother Goose that Humpty's killers are going in and changing the storybooks, removing pages, and thus changing how many of these characters like Robin Hood act. You know how movies like Shrek, all memes aside, are genuinely good movies in part because of how they recontextualize or lampoon classic stories like this in a way that feels unique while respecting their origins? That's what Diggs does so well that you just want more. Seeing our bookworm gumshoe straight up digging through the pages of the book as he tells you to turn to the next scene, or commanding you to hit the radio or don't pick up the phone, both of which use only your hands to poke at the augmented overlay rather than rely on the move controller, it all highlights the promise that Wonder Book could have had. In fact, the only time move is used at all in this game is when you go back to revisit any of the game's three chapters, as you can take pictures of hidden clues or landmarks. Tilting the book around to shine the light into a certain space to give Diggs a hand, or rotating it to get a new eye on your surroundings, it's done far more interestingly than the first three games. It's a shame then that some segments, mostly stuff like a chase sequence or guiding Diggs down a river, or even shining a light onto different sheep in a really long whack-a-mole sort of minigame, they often overstay their welcome. I understand why, this game isn't even 90 minutes long as it is, so they wanted to pad things out at least a little bit. And maybe it's a little bit damning that the best Wonder Book ideas that London Studio could come up with across nearly five years of development and a couple more years of pre-planning were limited to turning, or slightly closing, or tilting the book, but I would say looking at those Book of Tales demo screenshots, they understood that it was all about making the context of these actions unique. Like the example here of closing and opening the book to pump Frankenstein's heart, or in Diggs Nightcrawler's case, slowly rotating the book counterclockwise to untie digs, all while avoiding the occasional glance by the nearby guard. Stuff like that, or the highway chase sequence where tilting the book at the right time slams your car into the escaping killer's bumper, or folding the book to shine light onto a magnifying glass and mirror combo to set rope alight and free digs from uh, actually the same trap as that other rope one, it's part of an extended sequence, but, but still, it treats these actions the same way as you would normally treat pressing X or square. All games are those buttons at the end of the day, it's what the game is doing by making you press the buttons that matters. It's why I would have actually loved to see what sort of Toy Story game was in store, because the early concept art of that game showed the same level of creatively understanding the task and the medium at hand. You'd never really get many great video game games out of a book, of course, but if you got fun and unique interactive experiences, sometimes that's almost better because it's more memorable. I played Diggs a couple weeks ago at this point, and it was memorable enough to continue popping into my mind, unique enough that I really want others to have a chance to at least see part of the game in action. It's no different than finding that one Wii game that absolutely kills being a Wii game, even if it's something like, say, Red Steel, where it's not the best game, there's just nothing like finding a game that nails its gimmick. I don't think Wonder Book would have ever realistically had super long legs, especially since it also happened to land right next to another kid-aimed gimmick in Toys to Life while juggling the internal motion battle within Sony. Add in this being late PS3 era Sony, where if the wind blew slightly in the wrong direction, it felt like the company was likely to take that as a sign and completely drop support for any given product or game, and you get one of the last innovative little gimmicks that PlayStation produced before it started unifying its brand identity around large-scale AAA experiences. The last of that line of buzzes or sing stars or iToy games, the smaller projects where a studio just went nuts with admittedly little oversight. Now I am not out here longing for a return to those days exactly. A lot of Sony's PS3 output 
sucked. It, it, it really sucked. We just don't remember all the crap, because even the most keyed-in fans would go their entire lives without knowing about at least one deep cut, like a camera-based trading card game, or Tokyo Jungle, or 17 different FPS series all trying to coexist, or multiple competing cart games, or whatever the hell Loco Roco was. I can go on and on and on. I don't miss all of what came with that era of all-over-the-place creativity, because that also meant a ton of projects that were simply sent out to die, or sent to little to no audience. Instead, I'm actually kind of happy that looking back at Wonderbook ended up leading to a pretty interesting bit of history, mixed in with a far more promising quirky gimmick than I expected when I bought these games like a year ago, or when I was falling asleep watching that dreadful E3 showcase like a decade ago. Hopefully the journey through some strange and surprisingly intertwined PS2 to PS3 internal drama, for, for lack of a better term, was just as interesting to you. If it was, let me know. I've always got a bunch of game history oddities on my video to-do list, and every single time it feels like it ends up with me going down this unexpected rabbit hole. And if you want more, check out my video about the Wii's least used feature if you haven't already. That one was even more obsolete than the Wonder Book, and yet it was used about a dozen more times. As always, until next time, stay golden. For as little as a dollar a month over at patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt, you can get access to the exclusive Golden Cult Discord server. It may or may not be a cult at this point, I'm not sure. And for $5 and up, you can get early and ad-free access to videos just like this one. If you're super cool, I might even say your name like these fine folks. Goldstorm07, Malkavio, Mason Hunt, Philly D360, Phyrexian Sleeper Agent, and so many more. Again, that's patreon.com slash thegoldenbolt. Thank you.